is a truly plug and play, no wiring required, full split phase home backup available? EcoFlow thinks so. If you live in a country that has split phase like the US, some components in the home run off of 120 volts AC and some run off of 240 volts AC. It's not a simple solution to efficiently deliver both in a pure sine wave form. EcoFlow sent me these four components to do just that. Two Delta Pros, one split phase hub, and one generator extension cable. So that I can simply plug them in and show you what can be achieved with their all-in-one plug and play system. Welcome back to Projects with Everyday Dave. Let's see what this system can really do. Before we get started with the testing, I'm guessing you noticed the smash screen on this unit. And that's entirely my fault. I did it within the first couple of hours of opening the box. The first thing I wanted to do was see if I could actually simply plug everything in and deliver 120 volt, 240 volt backup. The plug for the hub is kind of awkward in its positioning and the units are very heavy. So I popped out the convenient handle and rolled them into place. Well, the units are very heavy, about 100 pounds, and they roll very easily. When I backed the second unit up to the first, very quickly because I was in such a rush to see if this would work. The handle of the tilted unit rammed right into the screen of the other. I heard the crush of the screen and moaned, instantly recognizing my colossal mistake. Fortunately, screen damage does not affect performance in any way, and EcoFlow already sent me a pair of remote displays to make filming easier, so we can continue testing, no problem. The one thing that is required for this to be a simple, no wiring, no inspection, plug and play activity is a transfer switch with a generator plug. Fortunately, past Dave was looking out for future Dave when he built this house and added a sub panel with emergency circuits and a transfer switch and a generator plug outside the building. Of course, this battery backup solution didn't exist back then, but generators did. And that's the great thing about this EcoFlow system. It can be used just like a gas power generator. If your home doesn't have a generator input and a transfer switch, you can have one added. It's a very common addition, something any electrician should be able to do for you. So let's plug it in and see how it works. If your house is like mine and it's already set up for a generator, then you'll have a plug to connect your generator to. They can be different amperages, so you have to make sure your plug matches. In my case, I have a higher amperage plug on this end, and I'll put some information on the types in the description. But I can simply plug it in, give it a quarter turn, and now we're connected to the building. Now all I have to do is connect the other end to our EcoFlow hub, and then flip the transfer switch, and we'll have power to all of our emergency circuits. Now with the units in position, I just need to attach the double voltage hub. It has a very nice, sturdy plug, but the orientation of the plugs is pretty inconvenient. It snaps in very securely. The cable's very rigid, so it's, it's hard to get a good position for it. For now, I'm just gonna lay it all out like this. I think you could stack these up and reconfigure it in a more convenient way. Then with just the standard 30 amp twist lock plug, I can plug it in and turn it. And then I can connect the other end to my generator extension cord, which has a 30 amp plug on this end and a 50 amp plug on the other end. All right, it's plugged in, let's power it up. There's a button on the back of the hub. Turn that on, you hear several clicks, and that's disconnecting the AC connections on each one of the inverters, so now only the hub is powered. So now we have power to the house, we just need to flip the transfer switch and check the voltages, make sure everything's right, and turn some circuits on. Let's briefly go over how a split phase load center is laid out. There are four conductors coming into the panel. Line one, line two, neutral, and ground. The ground will connect to the ground bus bar. In this case, there are two of them. The neutral will connect to the neutral bus bar. In this case, there are two and they're linked by this connector. So the main neutral just comes into this main lug. And then line one and line two connect to these two lugs. From either one of these lugs to neutral, you have 120 volts. And between these two lugs, you have 240 volts. The reason this is important is if you're trying to balance loads in your house, you need to understand which breakers are gonna be on which leg. Notice that there are two bus bars, one for each one of these legs running down the length of the load center. And there are tabs bent up 
alternating between each bus bar. So this bus bar has a tab here, and then it skips and has a tab here, and so on down the line. And this bus bar has a tab here, and then it skips this one and has one here. So a single pole breaker like this one will share this tab on each side. When you latch it in, it connects to this top bar, this row, and alternately, a breaker latched in on the left side also shares this same tab. The next row down will utilize the tab from this line. So this row of breakers is off of this line, the next row of breakers is off of this line, and so on and so forth, all the way down the panel. Alternating rows switch line one, line two. If you have a double pole breaker like this one, notice there are two contacts, one for each one of those tabs. When you place this breaker in, it takes up two rows and you have a contact for each line one and line two. And the voltage between those two contacts will give you your 240 volt load. Anytime you have a double pole breaker, the load is always balanced because it takes an equal amount from each one of the lines. So when you're laying out your circuits, you can consider which loads will be on at any given time and place them in alternating rows to better balance your loads. Alternately, you could use an auto transformer to help balance those loads, but that's a topic for another day. All right, I connected the two units. Now I'm gonna take the cover off my transfer switch and make sure that the voltages are correct before I switch it on. So this side is the input power from the grid and it is 249 volts right now. And the power from the solar generator is 240. On the house, from one leg to neutral, it's 125. The other leg to neutral, 125. And our generator from one leg to neutral is 116. And the other leg to neutral is 125. I'm not sure why one leg is 116 and the other one is 125. However, both of those are within range of where they need to be for appliances to work. So I think we're okay to move forward and try out some appliances. To start with, just to be careful, I'm gonna turn off all of the circuits that are on my two panels that are emergency circuits. Uh, right now, this inverter is just passed through. It's not doing anything, so the goal is to take what is currently fed from the mains, and this breaker will switch it over to our inverters. So let me turn off Okay, now I can switch over to our inverter. Now I can try and power some things up. Let's start with a very important load, the well. It's a 240 volt load. I'm just gonna turn this on to relieve the pressure. All right, all the residual pressures out of the lines, that's just draining from the head pressure from the rest of the building. So now we can go turn it on and see how much it draws. Luke sent me their 393 FC, which is a category three, 1500 volt true RMS clamp meter. This is gonna help me safely take very precise measurements on my future solar projects. And I really like the flexible current loop, it's super handy. And I've wrapped it around one of these legs and that's going to allow us to measure the current and to start with the inrush current from the well as I kick it on here. All right, I've got the meter set to inrush and I'll flip the water on. And right away we can see seven, 800 watts coming from each inverter. Nice balanced load there. I have a couple hundred watts of solar coming into this inverter. And then our peak inrush current was 6.3 amps per leg. And our constant current is 2.6, 2.7 amps. Looks like the well pump has caught up and now it's just running that faucet which is taking six, 700 watts combined from the two units. Now I'm just monitoring one leg. So I can start adding some other circuits here. Let's load up one inverter and see what happens. I can turn on the fridge. It'll take a minute for that to kick in. Kitchen outlets, kitchen lights. All right, now you can see we pull in about five amps and the loads are a little bit unbalanced. We still have the 300 watt base load from the well, but now we've added lights and the refrigerator and a few other things, and we have 600 watts 
coming from inverter A. Now, if I turn everything else on, garage lights, now you can see they're back to almost balanced because the lights in the refrigerator in the kitchen are balancing out the lights in the garage and the well has an even amount on each side. So we have a pretty balanced load at the moment, but we can push that. I can plug some things in to this outlet. We've got about five amps on the one leg. So we've got a lot of headroom here. We're, we're nowhere near the limit of the inverter. So let's start adding some more loads. All right, let's add the heat gun to one side. Ooh. Now we're pushing a little bit, 12 amps, coming on one inverter, the top inverter here. I'll kick it up to full. 14 amps on that one leg, 1600 watts. Got lots of space. Let's add the compressor. A little pancake compressor here. Add that in. So many things I can hold. 14 amps. Hmm, well that was no problem. All right, let's try the microwave and the well at the same time. The water's running. All right, that's pretty good load. We have 2,600 watts coming out of one inverter, 5,500 coming out of the other inverter. I wonder if we can overload it. I don't wanna overload it with the microwave running, so I'll let the microwave finish, then I'll plug in a bunch of heaters and we'll see what it takes to overload this thing. All right, I've got a couple 1,500 watt heaters here. This Radiant one and a fake wood stove one, I'll plug them in. And if that's not enough, I'll add the heat gun until we overload the thing. All right, let's see. Pretty even load right now. Let's start adding stuff. All right, right away, 1,800 watts from that heater. And we are pulling 13 and a half amps. All right, let's add the heat gun to it. The inverter fans have kicked on. Here we are, 3,000 watts, 22.7 amps. I'm gonna plug in the other 1500 watt heater because that wasn't enough. All right, let's kick it up. Whoa. I'm up over 4,000 watts there for a second. Let's try full power. 3,300 watts. That leg is getting 25 amps all by itself. We were well over 3,000 watts. We still haven't killed it. Well, I guess I'll add the heat gun. All right, here we go. 31 amps, 3,700 watts. Holy smokes. Four thousand watts. Forty-two, almost forty-three hundred watts. Thirty-four point three amps on one leg. I don't know why that hasn't tripped yet. Oh, there it goes. Finally hit the overload, 4,300 watts for quite a while there before it tripped. Probably have to turn the inverter back on. All right, I just hit the button, flipped right back on. Everything powered right back up. So we'll go back and look at the film, but it looks like about 4,300 watts for close to a minute. Wow, that's pretty impressive. All right, now that we know the overload limit for the system running in parallel with 240 volt loads and running the whole house, lights and microwave and well and all kinds of other equipment, multiple 1,500 watt heaters. <laughs> okay. Well, I wanna do a couple of tests to see what each unit can do by itself. I wanna do a cold test, cold soak test. Uh, how long can one inverter run the refrigerator? A couple of other things, just a capacity test, just to round out the performance characteristics. 
This video isn't trying to cover absolutely everything, but just give you a good overview of whole home capacity testing, and then I'll summarize it at the end. I used the 12 volt car adapter to test the total available DC power. I ran the port right at its 10 amp max, but after one to two hours, it would shut off. I assumed it was because of overheating, although I didn't see any errors. I contacted EcoFlow and they confirmed it was the result of automatic heat protection. I reset it, reduced the current to 9.5 amps, and it ran the remainder of the 27 hours with no issues. The total time drawing about 100 watts was 27 hours and 13 minutes. The total power delivered was 3,021 watt hours out of the available advertised 3,600 watt hours. That is 84% of its rated capacity, which is a pretty good result for these all-in-one power stations from the ones I've tested. I did my regular fridge test to see how many hours one unit can run the fridge under normal use. This result, will also be able to be used for a rough estimate for available AC capacity when being used for long-term cycling loads. The fridge ran almost exactly 1.5 days. It was 31 hours and 59 minutes, and it consumed 2.44 kilowatt hours. If I compare that to the actual usable battery capacity of 3.02 kilowatt hours from the DC capacity test, then I get an efficiency of 81% which is very good, especially considering all the idle time that the inverter is on just waiting for the fridge to need power. The advertised standby power consumption with both AC and DC powered on is 30 watts, but the results of this test would indicate with just the AC power on, the idle consumption is only 18 watts, and that's pretty good. One nice feature on the Delta Pro is its variable speed AC charging. It has a switch on the back to switch between slow and fast charging, Slow charging is better for the batteries, but if you're in a hurry, you can charge it quickly. The slow charge from zero to 100% took 10 hours and 39 minutes. It consumed 4.62 kilowatt hours. That's an overall round trip efficiency of 65.4%. In fast charge mode, it took only two hours and seven minutes. All right, I've been running these for several hours now. It's been powering lots of circuits in the house, the well and lights and microwave and kitchen appliances. I wanna try and add a little bit of solar. I have a few panels laying out in the backyard. It's not very sunny out today, but first thing you wanna do is check and make sure the voltage is within the range of the unit. And we're at 107 volts, so definitely within the range. And we can plug that into the back port. Now with my clamp meter, I can measure current coming in. So I'm at three amps, almost exactly three amps. Way below capacity for the unit and those panels, but there's not much sun to work with today. So yeah, we'll take what we can get. All right, now you can see we have about 270 watts going in and 360 watts plus going out. Nearly balanced input and output for this particular inverter. If we had some more panels, I could add them to the other inverter. So we'll let it run like that for a while. I wanna see how having imbalance between the inverters works out. Are they able to manage that between themselves or do they get further and further out of balance? Well, this is definitely the most plug and play system I've done so far. I set the two units together, plugged them into each other, added my extension cable to go out to the transfer switch input and flip the transfer switch, we were up and running. Then to add a little bit of solar, I connected a few panels in the yard and strung a wire up to the back of one of the inverters. And there you go, we have solar coming in, power going out, 120 and 240 volt units running. No problem so far. Well, it looks like the imbalance in the discharge and charge is not automatically balancing. On this side, we have solar coming in and it's holding it up at nearly 100%. And this unit with no solar coming in happens to have most of the load, so it's down to 75%. I was really hoping that the units would automatically balance the battery charge between them, but it looks like I'm gonna have to manually move the solar input to the other unit to try and bring it up because this one's fully charged. All right, it's been really cold, so I thought I'd do a cold soak. It was about eight degrees Fahrenheit. I let it soak all night long and we'll see if it can run things and whether or not it will charge under those conditions. I've got the remote display here. We'll see if it powers on.
Well, the inverter came on. Let's see if it'll run a load. Six hundred watts. Wow, that's pretty good. I'm surprised that it's running at this low temperature. Kick it on up. Yeah, it can keep warm out here. Yeah, almost 1200 watts, so it's running it no problem. Also, when I put the battery out last night, it was at 75% and it's still showing exactly 75%. All right, one of the other issues with using these batteries when it's really cold is charging. So we've seen it can actually provide power. Let's see if we can charge it at this temperature. <laughs> okay, I heard a click and it's not charging. And you see there's this little low temperature icon flashing on the display here. And that's exactly what it should be doing because these batteries do not like to be charged below freezing. So that tells us that the low temperature sensor is working and the unit is self-protecting by not charging at these temperatures. So what that tells you is you'll be able to use power from your unit when it's very cold out, but you won't be able to charge it until you bring it up to temperature. Now, if you're using these in an off-grid situation where you're continuously charging and discharging them every day, you'll need to make sure you're keeping them in a place where they're above freezing. The largest 240 volt load I have in the house is this geothermal heat pump. It's a three ton heat pump, but it's not connected to my emergency circuits. I never thought I would be running this big of a load off of an emergency capable device. But today we're gonna try and see if the EcoFlow system can power my entire heating and cooling system. Don't do this at home, but I have wired the system directly to the geothermal heat pump using an extension cable. So I have both EcoFlows connected together with a double voltage hub, and then I've plugged the geothermal unit directly into that so I can supply 240 volts. I'll use the fluke meter to measure the inrush current and then later switch to current and then I'll use my kiwatts meter to measure the voltage. All right, I'm gonna turn it on. Let's see what happens. The pump, oh, overload. Well, I know the running load it could handle, so it seems like the surge current, which is very high, and I could measure that real quick using the AC connection just for reference, but apparently that's a little bit too much for the system to handle. I know it'll handle it once it's started. Maybe there's a soft start system that would allow it to, but looks like the geothermal heat pump is just a little bit too much. All right, I switched it back over to mains power. Now I'll turn the unit on and see what the actual inrush current is. I wrapped the current sensor around the line that goes to the heat pump motor only so we don't catch the circulation pump to trigger the inrush current too soon. And I'll try it again. and three amps. No wonder it failed. 203 amps is, is uh, that's a lot. No wonder it couldn't pick that up. Okay, well, I guess it's unrealistic to think that it would ever be able to carry that pump. Let's bring all this together with some conclusions. First, this is a truly plug and play backup system no experience required. First, connect the multi-voltage hub to the Delta Pros, then connect the hub to your generator input. Then you simply have to turn on the multi-voltage hub and flip the transfer switch and you're in business. It can run everything in my house, all the 240 volt and 120 volt loads, except my three ton geothermal heat pump. That was not unexpected. My heat pump has a massive starting current of over 200 amps, and that was just too much for the system to deliver. Other than that, it can run the 240 volt well, microwave, lights, and other appliances all at the same time. No need to run extension cords all over the place in an emergency. Just use all of your appliances as normal. 
It has multi-speed AC charging and very capable solar input. I didn't get a chance to fully test the solar performance, but the 1600 watt input has great specs with a voltage range from 11 to 150 volts and a 15 amp max current. That's a great range and gives you lots of options for solar panel configurations. For some reason, this MC4 to XT60 connector doesn't come with the unit, so if you want to do any solar charging, be sure and order this accessory. The system has temperature sensors to protect the battery from charging below freezing temperatures. Something to be aware of, if you're operating in a below freezing environment, you can discharge, but you won't be able to charge the battery. One of my favorite features on this power station is the ability to manually set the maximum charge and minimum discharge state for the battery. If you're using the battery as a UPS or for a small off-grid system, this allows you to adjust the top and bottom limits and greatly increase the service life of the battery. The UPS function works great, providing true pass-through AC power with no impact to the battery. The physical positioning of the double voltage hub is a little bit inconvenient. And when you connect a double voltage hub, the 120 volt outlets on each unit are disabled. If you're running everything off your house, that's fine. But it would be nice if EcoFlow at least included a couple of 120 volt outlets on the double voltage hub. But in the spirit of plug and play, I have a solution. You can purchase this 240 volt to double 120 volt splitter off of Amazon and presto, you have 120 volt access. Now I can plug the iron into one plug and we see we're getting power on the first inverter, about 1300 watts. I can plug this heater into the other one. Now the other inverter's delivering a little over 1,000 watts. So back to 120 volts, power for each inverter through the 240 volt hub. If you need to, you can get a splitter for the output of the hub so you can run both the house and the splitter at the same time. So there's a easy plug and play way to get 120 and 240 from the double voltage hub. Maybe in the future they'll upgrade it so you can get that right off of the hub itself. But for now, there's a plug and play solution. Unfortunately, the units can't share battery capacity. If you happen to draw more power from one leg of the system, you won't be able to take full advantage of your total combined battery capacity. I did hear back from the EcoFlow technicians and the reason for the slight imbalance in voltage between the legs is an intentional method to help balance the state of charge between the units, which is pretty clever, but it's not enough to solve large imbalances. It seems like EcoFlow could solve this problem by connecting the two Delta Pros with the same cord that's used for expansion batteries through these extra ports, and then some software to help balance the load. That's not a game changer, just something you need to be aware of when planning your capacity and circuit distribution in your sub panels. I hope this has given you a good first look at the split phase capability of the EcoFlow Delta Pro that can be achieved with just these four parts. Overall, this is an amazing system. The combination of features, capability, simplicity of use make it a great choice for an emergency home backup system. EcoFlow is offering a significant exclusive discount for my viewers. Simply use the link and the discount code in the description. In addition, US taxpayers may be eligible for an additional 30% tax credit for qualifying solar installations. Please consult with your tax advisor. You can follow this QR code and find more information on my website, projectswithdave.com. I have lots of additional testing and projects coming in future videos, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.